In October of 2008, President Thomas S. Monson stood up in general conference to give an announcement. I am pleased to announce five new temples for which sites have been acquired and which in coming months and years will be built in the following locations. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Cordoba, Argentina. The greater Kansas City area. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then, pausing and smiling, he looked over the Conference Center congregation and said, And Rome, Italy. After the audible gasp, understanding the significance of this announcement, President Monson smiled and even chuckled a little bit, drawing laughter from the audience. <laughs> well, over in Utah, when President Monson announced this, stained glass artist Tom Holdman and his wife Gail were watching in their home. And Tom actually jumped out of his chair and said out loud, I will do that temple glass. Tom has done art glass in over 80 temples for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world. And he and his Holdman Studios were indeed given the project to do the art glass in the Rome Temple. They created about 800 art glass windows that are in that building, no two of which are alike. However, they also created a masterpiece of art glass for the Rome Temple Visitor Center, where they created a 20 foot wide by seven foot tall window that symbolically depicts the life parables and miracles of Jesus in one cohesive scene. The window became a prominent part of the temple dedication with the international press conference being held right in front of it. Buongiorno a tutti e a tutte soprattutto. Benvenuti. And I hope that the members and the missionaries bring their family and their friends and teach the gospel of Christ right here in this visitor center. Well, how did Tom Holdman and his team pull that window off? Although they did most all the heavy lifting, they had a little bit of help from some BYU religion professors, including Brad Wilcox, Tyler Griffin, and yes, even my lowly self, uh, Anthony Sweat. It all started when you called me and Tony and said, hey, I need, I need some help. And we had no idea what you had cooked up. And when you presented this, this idea that the Holdmans were, were commissioned to do this window for the Rome Temple Visitor Center. Originally, it was just going to be one pane, and then they expanded it out and made it bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you came to us, you said they want to include every parable in, in the entire New Testament symbolically in a stained glass window. Along with Tom Holdman's wife, Gail, the three of us joined together to write a book explaining each aspect of the window, what it means, and how it can apply to modern saints. So today on Why Religion, I'm really excited to have Brad Wilcox interview Tyler Griffin about this project and the book publication, leading listeners through an auditory explanation of the window, the events that it portrays, and what we can learn from them. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. In this episode today, in part one, Brad's going to talk with Tyler about why we did uh, this book project, why Tom Holdman and his team did the window, what's in the window, and its symbolism in Christ's life. In part two, they're going to focus a little bit more on why this matters, focusing on applying some of the lessons that the window teaches about the parables of Jesus. And in part three, as always, Professor Griffin will share a little bit about his academic journal and why he chooses faith. And before, by the way, we get on with the interview, they're going to talk a lot about the window. And since it's hard to imagine it sometimes, if you go to whyreligion.byu.edu, we've put a high-resolution image of the window on our website so you can click on that and take a look at it either before, during, or after you listen to this episode to help you visualize what they're talking about. Okay, without any further delay, here's Professor Brad Wilcox 
talking with his colleague and co-author, Professor Tyler Griffin. Now, Tyler and Anthony Sweat and I have been involved with an incredible project over the last, what, two years? And it has been an amazing experience for us. And I want to ask Tyler a little bit about his experience and his feelings about this great experience as we've acted as consultants on the Come Unto Me window that is in the visitor center at the Rome Temple. So tell us a little bit about the window. Tell us a little bit about the book and how we were invited to be a part of this. That's, uh, it all started when you called me and Tony and said, hey, I need, I need some help. And we had no idea what you had cooked up. And when you presented this, this idea that the Holdmans were, were commissioned to do this window for the Rome Temple Visitor Center, originally it was just going to be one pane, and then they expanded it out and made it bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you came to us, you said they want to include every parable in, in the entire New Testament symbolically in a stained glass window. And every miracle. It was amazing because this was kind of from the missionary, missionary department. They said, we want the window to be a beautiful piece of art, but we also want it to be a teaching tool. And so the Holdmans came to me and said, can we do this? Do you think it's even possible? And I said, well, I can't do it alone, not in the timeline that we're, we've been given. So I said, I know Tyler is an incredible scholar of the New Testament, and he would be able to give some great input on what the New Testament world would have been like uh, when Christ was there. And so although the scene is uh, kind of a made-up scene in a square uh, it, or a, a city center, it uh, it still is very authentic to the time period. What are some suggestions you made that the artists followed that made it uh, be more realistic? Well, there were a lot of things. You know, they Tom's group is ex- extremely creative and very, very gifted and talented with their with their craft of creating stained glass. So, as we entered the project, we just started giving them feedback on the buildings and changing things with the temple in the background, with the uh, the inscription on the the building behind Jesus's right shoulder. I remember one of the artists saying, Greek, why would it need to be in Greek? And you explaining that that would have been the international language in Jesus's day. Yeah. Um, Just little things like the different types of plants, the different uh, elements regarding how to, how to integrate the, the elements from the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, just tying in all of the symbols for every parable, every miracle. And then we added, remember, to say, hey, let's put in some of the major life events, birth, temptation, baptism, even presentation in the temple when he was 40 days old, there's el- there are elements in here. And that's really the magic of what happened here is I just went through and I made a spreadsheet of every miracle, a spreadsheet of every parable, and a spreadsheet of every life event. And then we started collaboratively working together on, okay, how could we portray each one of these to be able to get as much of it in there as as possible? And that was remarkable. In this space, to fit all of that symbolically was was a a miracle, especially in the amount of time that we had to do it. Talk about some of the, let's start with some of the life events that were important to you and how they were portrayed and what doctrine, what kind of teachings did you pull from those life events for the book, Come Unto Me? Good question. So the, the for those who've never seen the, the, the stained glass or, or haven't seen a picture of the window or the drawing, just picture in your mind a big market scene with Jesus in the center, in the foreground, healing an individual with uh, some pretty serious skin lesions and, and some frailties with a crutch. He's, he's crippled to one degree and he has bandages. That's in the, in the center. And then everything goes around it with different people. Most people are looking at Jesus or are have their attention focused on the middle. Um, all of the buildings, all of the vanishing lines... If you know art, you realize that there are 
all of those lines point to something in in the distance, and that's the vanishing point. The neat thing about this particular uh, painting or this particular window is all of those vanishing points come straight to the bosom of Christ. It's his heart is the, the focal point for all of these lines that draw your attention into him. So then with his life events, you have everything from pre birth. There's up on the far left hand corner, there's an inscription on a on a building with three Hebrew letters, Dalit Vav Dalit, which in the Hebrew would be D V D for us in English, David. I remember when the artist said to you, why is that important? Why should we put that on the building? And when you explained it to them, they were just mesmerized. Tell the listeners why that would be important. So for the the Jewish audience, they have they have what you call messianic expectations. They've been waiting for the coming of a Messiah to redeem Israel. And it's been prophesied that that Messiah will come as the son of David to take the throne of David and and rule and reign in the house of Israel forever, right? So they've been waiting for a son of David. So Matthew, to open his gospel, if you've ever started with this uh, New Year's resolution to say, I'm going to read the New Testament, it's kind of discouraging for some people because they start into Matthew chapter 1 and it's this long list of genealogy. And they're like, oh, what can be more boring, right? Well, the way Matthew did it on purpose was he couched it into three sets of 14. Now, of course, one of them, we're missing a name, so it's actually 13, but he intended for it to be 14, 14, 14. That doesn't mean anything to most people, but to the Jews, the number 14 meant a lot because DVD, Dalit Vav Dalit, it's the fourth and the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You add that up and you get 14. So every name has a number attached to it. So if you say 14, everybody knows you're talking about King David. So when Matthew opens his book with a genealogy list that has 14 generations, then 14 generations, then 14 generations, it's Matthew's code way of talking to Jews saying, listen up guys, we're talking about the son of David who's going to fulfill all of your messianic expectations. This is the Christ. Tell us about the or the symbols of the birth. So the birth has a lot of elements attached to it. You've got Mary, obviously, his mother symbolized in the purple and the, the deep blue robe over on the far, far right side. You've got the turtle doves that represent that sacrifice um, given for him in the temple, symbolized by the dove that comes up in the baptism later, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You have uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh all portrayed in here. And I, I think, honestly, Brad, one of the things that made this project, um, that just put a nice touch on it, was the fact that you were able to go to Israel and actually bring back some actual elements to include in the window. It's not just all stained glass. There are actual elements in there. It would be fun for you frankincense. to... Frankincense. We, we bought some actual frankincense, which the artist kind of put together into a little um, plastic, waxy uh, covering, and then they wove that right into the window. So it's there. The frankincense is right there. What else did you bring back from the, from the Holy Land? Oh, there were some coins, some authentic coins that were from the time period of Jesus Christ. We also found some salt from the Dead Sea, and I brought the actual salt back, and they were able to put chunks of salt in the window. So there's a lot of things for for uh, children and teenagers to try to find, almost like a Where's Waldo when they're standing there in front of the window. But I think another element of the birth that I think is so beautiful is that we've got the sheep, the little lamb representing the Lamb of God, but also the shepherds that have have come. And there's a star right over here on top of this, mus- this mausoleum-looking building, a beautiful star reminding us of the star that led the wise men to Christ. It's beautiful. And uh, underneath that star, you have the, uh, the famous, you know, da Vinci depiction of the Last Supper, which we thought was very fitting for a Rome temple visitor center that you've got to give a nod to da Vinci, right? Yeah. 
and underneath that, then the, the saying that is the name of the book, the name of the window, the name of this whole effort. But it's in Greek, like you said before, Deo te pros me, which is come unto me. And that is, that is portrayed at every phase of his life. So the wise men come unto him from following the star. The shepherds come unto him. And all through his life, that is his invitation to come unto him, take his yoke upon you so that you can find out that his burden is easy. Beautiful. Now, I wish we could talk about every little inch of the window, but let's skip ahead to the baptism, which is also portrayed, not directly in the window, but symbols that remind us of the priests, of of John the Baptist's authority and of that baptism. Describe those for a minute. So we didn't, we didn't put an actual figure, a person in here directly to represent John, although you could, you could make arguments for any, a couple of these, these guys that are pictured being a symbol for John. But we've represented him more with a, an almond blossom, with a rod symbolic of Aaron and that Aaronic priesthood that, that uh, John the Baptist held. We've got... Um, Obviously, the Holy Ghost descending, symbolized in art, usually as a dove. That's one of my favorite features of the the whole window, actually, is the fact that the Holy Ghost symbol, the dove, is off in the far corner up in the, the right, and it's hidden. You can't really see it unless you're... If you just glance at the window, you're going to miss it. But if you look closely, you'll see this white dove... And he's coming, he's flying with wings outstretched towards Jesus. And behind him, it's all dark. It's all stormy. In front of him, it's it's all light. And I love the symbolism of if you if you look for the spirit, you'll find you'll find him, you'll recognize his voice speaking to you, and he will point you to and bring you to Christ. Now one of the focus points in the window and one of the obviously the the most important part of Christ's life was his atonement. Um, Talk us through some of the symbols of Christ's atonement in the window. This is uh, obviously everything that he taught, everything in his parables, everything in his miracles, his whole life, every event is pointing us forward to that great and last sacrifice. So you have beautifully portrayed the the Old Testament sacrifices and the, the temple sacrifices portrayed in the background on the right. In front of the temple, you can see this, this column of smoke rising in front of the temple to symbolize those sacrifices being made that point us to Christ's sacrifice. Now he begins that by going into Gethsemane, and that is portrayed right underneath his his arm that is reaching out, which to me was a, a powerful reminder of it's much more than Jesus just going in and in isolation suffering. His suffering is focused on individuals. It's focused on us. The reason he's going in under the weight of that symbolic millstone that is portrayed back there, that geth semeni, that geth shemen, this place where oil is pressed down so much so that those olives bleed from every pore. They're just, they're they're broken open and they give up all of that precious uh, oil. It's portrayed there in such a way that that stone functions in two ways. It's it's not only crushing those olives, and there's an olive tree right behind Jesus and his apostles there. That's kind of the central feature is this olive tree back there. But then it also represents, you can see in the corner of that stone, a little opening behind it. So it represents the, the tomb and the opening of the tomb and the breaking of the bonds of, of death. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. As we've been talking about symbols and images in the Rome Temple Visitor Center window, I thought it would be great to draw your attention to another recently published book that also has images as part of its major focus. It's called Finding Christ in the Covenant Path, Ancient Insights for Modern Life by Jennifer C. Lane. 
She's a professor of religious education and is currently serving as the Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. This book offers a fresh but faithful focus on the journey of covenants and discipleship through analyzing them in two unique lenses. The first is ancient words, and the second is medieval images. The first part of the book helps us see Christ's identity as our Redeemer by exploring the ancient words that connect covenants, redemption, worship, the presence of the Lord, and sitting down enthroned in God's presence as his children and heirs. The second part of the book reveals Christ as our ransom by exploring medieval images, particularly the image of Christ. This section uses devotional images and late medieval practices of contemplation as a counterpoint to the restoration practices and ordinances so that we can more fully appreciate the gift of God's Son and see it with fresh eyes. Again, the book is called Finding Christ in the Covenant Path. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Professor Brad Wilcox interview Professor Tyler Griffin on our research publication called Come Unto Me, analyzing the gigantic and just breathtaking stained glass window that's in the Rome Temple Visitor Center that depicts Christ's parables, miracles, and his major life events. For part two of Our Religion, we like to explore why this research publication matters to an everyday saint. What can we learn from it? So here's Professor Wilcox and Griffin exploring some of these why questions, focusing mostly on what we can learn and apply from the parables of Jesus depicted in the window. Let's switch now and talk just a little bit about the parables that are in the window. What are some of your favorite? And not just how they're portrayed in the window, but tell us some of the reasons these parables matter. So there are there are so many parables. And in this book, we've we've included every parable from the New Testament. And like you said before, many of the objects are going to cover uh, multiple parables because you just don't have you don't have the physical space in the window to portray every single parable in isolation from all the others. So some of my favorites are that are really prominent. You have the parable of the lost sheep. <clears throat> You've got that lamb there on the right, symbolic of of that sheep getting lost and Jesus leaving the ninety nine to go and find the one. And the lost coin. Yes, and there's this this little coin that's pictured underneath the flagstone here to the right of the man who's being healed. If you're not looking for it, you won't see it, um, which is very symbolic of things that are lost. If you're not looking for them, you won't likely see them. And that's Jesus's whole mission. Come unto me means sometimes you can come on your own and sometimes somebody has to go and find you. Well, we see the prodigal son also portrayed Talk about the link that there is between those three parables. So you have the lost sheep was first, the lost coin was second, and the lost son was third. And it's only Luke who gives us those stories, the parable of the lost and found in Luke 15. But you have the the son portrayed there on the far right-hand side center of the panel. You've got this, this lad who's sitting there with a pig to his right, which is, which is very uncharacteristic. You would never see a pig in a first century Jewish marketplace, and we're fully aware of that. But it's a symbolic way of teaching that this kid had made it to the rock bottom. He was out in a foreign country among Gentiles serving, working for this citizen of that land who was then sent out to feed the pigs. So he's in the depths of despair when he finally comes to himself and says, I will arise and go to my father. It's interesting in Luke 15, there's only one person who's upset when something that was lost is found. And it happens to be his older brother who's portrayed there to the right, to the far side of the painting. And he's, he's looking pretty upset at that younger brother for, for coming home and getting his, into his father's favor. And, uh, it's just a beautiful parable to show that Jesus came to found those who are lost. And if you're not lost, or at least if you, uh, if you think you're not lost, then you're not going to be looking for Jesus. And consequently, you're probably not going to come unto him. I think the audience that Jesus is addressing gives us a way of, of understanding what he was teaching 
Yeah, Joseph Smith taught that if you want to understand uh, parables and unlock meaning in the parables, you look for the setting. You look for the question that prompted the telling of the story. And once you understand that, then you can know what it was he was talking about. Well, the prompt for Luke 15 was Jesus was eating. He was having table fellowship with publicans and sinners. These are the outcasts of the Jewish society in the first century. These are, these are known, quote unquote, bad people. And Jesus is eating with them. And you've got Pharisees coming along, patting themselves on the back saying, we would never eat with those unclean people because we're righteous. We're good at keeping the law. We're holy. And why are you defiling yourself by eating with them? And he says, basically, I have three, three stories for you. And in every case, that which is lost is found and Joseph gives some pretty harsh interpretation, especially with uh, the parable of the lost sheep. He says the 99 sheep in that story are basically symbolic of the Pharisees who don't feel like they need a shepherd. They don't feel like they've ever been lost. And uh, then Jesus' statement, um, the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents more so than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And I love something you shared with us that when we were writing that phase. You said there really aren't 99 people who are so righteous that they need no repentance. But there are 99 people who think they're so righteous that they need no repentance. Yeah, but Jesus came for the one and he came for all of the ones. Beautiful. Um, I've always loved the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that's also portrayed there in the window beautiful there to the it's on the right hand side of the window about middle of the the right column and you've got this man who's leading a donkey with another individual who's clearly been beat up and he's bringing him to the inn beautifully portrayed where we can see the savior being this outcast of his society and he tells the story of a Samaritan who would be an outcast in Jewish society in the first century because he's half Jew, half something else. Well, so is Jesus. He's half Jew, half something else. And he, he comes to heal and to find people. He doesn't come across them by chance like the Levite and the priest that are portrayed in other, in other individuals in the window. Talk to us about some of the miracles that are portrayed. Obviously, we have a healing going on in the center of the window, but what are some of the other miracles that you see here in the window? Some of the other miracles that are, are noteworthy are the times that he's raising people from the dead. So you have the widow of Nain and her son in the background on the left of Jesus, and he, he looks like he's just been risen from the dead and his mother, who was a widow, it's not just that her son had his life given back to him, but now she, under that culture, has a future given back to her as well. In what way? Why would that matter? Because without a, if she's a widow and this is her son, mm -hmm. her only son, there's no male directly connected with her. She's limited in what she can own or what her rights are. But with her son brought back to life, it gives her a new life as well. It's kind of beautiful symbolism there. And it's fascinating to me because on the opposite side, on the right side, then you get this little girl. Uh, she's portrayed a little older. Um, but you have Talitha, Talitha the, the story of Jairus' daughter being raised. You could either depict her with the girl on the right or the girl on the far left. She's a little younger than 12, but it still works. Um, you also have Lazarus being raised from the dead. So we've portrayed Lazarus along with the widow of Nain's son, kind of same idea. Now, the first miracle that's recorded during Jesus's lifetime is changing water to wine. Um, obviously that's portrayed in the window, but would you tell us a little bit about why that miracle is significant and why would, you know, this seemingly, I mean, compared to raising people from the dead, it seems like a miracle that isn't as dramatic, but it does communicate something. What was Jesus trying to teach with that miracle? That is a loaded question, and uh, we're not going to be able to answer that fully in one little 
podcast here, there are a lot of layers of, of meaning there. It connects symbolically to the first plague back in Egypt of mm. turning the Nile River to blood. So you get a water to a, a, a red wine type um, symbol. You've got um, the sacramental element of Jesus referring to his suffering and his his agony as a bitter cup. So you picture this this water, this bitter water that, by the way, in John 2, with that particular miracle, the water that gets turned to wine, the only thing we know about is it's in big water pots of stone and it's used for the purifying of the Jews. The symbolism here is that clean water, when it, when that feast begins, dirty people walk in, have some sort of an interaction with that water and walk away. So dirty people become clean and clean water becomes bitter, becomes dirty. So now you tie that into this. So his first recorded miracle by John ties in and points us to his last ultimate miracle, which is also a symbolic water to wine in that he partakes of the bitter cup and the agony causes him to bleed from every pore using Luke's account. And lest we forget what he suffered, he gives us a cup every week, symbolic of, of wine, symbolic of his blood. So water to wine, this marriage feast, this, this connecting in a covenant relationship, Christ taking Israel, us as his, as his covenant um, uh, bride, so to speak. It's, it's all there at this wow. wedding in Cana. You know, just to think that people who are looking say, you can change something that's filthy and dirty into something that's clean. You can change us. You can change me from just the, the base and awful person that I am into somebody who is good. You can change my motives. You can change my heart, my nature. I think the Savior was definitely teaching of his incredible mission. You know, Brad, that's that's really the point of the whole window right there, what you just described, is the, the, all of these symbols, they're just nice artistic uh, renditions of different people or events or things. But at the end of the day, the fact is, is that he is mighty to save today, to change today, to heal and raise from the spiritual dead today. Um, it's it's the, the who cares, so what principle as we read the scriptures. We can learn all of the facts and figures about history, but until we taste of the sweetness of that wine that a few moments before was bitter in our own life, then it's just a story. It's just it's just a nice allegory, but it's it becomes real. It becomes palpable, tangible, when we get on the covenant path, put our trust in Him, and partake of His goodness today. Again, if you're interested in seeing the high resolution image of the Rome Temple stained glass window that's been discussed in this episode. You can go to whyreligion.byu.edu and you can find a link to take a look at this image. You can also find a link to the book publication, Come Unto Me, that discusses and analyzes this Rome Temple Visitor Center window. And while I'm at it, if you want to connect with us at Why Religion, comment and give insight on episodes that you've listened to, or see some behind the scenes photos and get bonus material, give us a follow on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast. Okay, we've arrived at the final part of this episode, part three of Why Religion, where we like to talk with the professor about why the professor chose to be a religious educator, what was their academic and career journey, and as a disciple, why they choose faith. So we wrap up this episode with Professor Tyler Griffin sharing a little bit about his academic and faith journey. Let's talk a little bit about you. What is your educational and professional background? Well, that's kind of an interesting question because I got my bachelor's degree in computer and electrical engineering, but that's not where my my heart was. That's where my head was, but my heart was in the classroom. I wanted to teach seminary. So I got hired to be a full-time seminary teacher. And from there, 
then I started working on a master's degree in instructional technology. Where were you teaching? I was teaching at Box Elder High School. And so where did, you, City. where did you pursue your degree? Got the degree at Utah State. I had an incredible instructional technology program there at that time and uh, finished the master's degree and then decided to pursue a doctorate degree in that same area, instructional technology, also from Utah State. So then they transferred us over to the institute there in Logan, adjacent to Utah State. And so I taught there for seven years before coming down here to the Department of Ancient Scripture back in and 2010. What, what brought you? What brought you to BYU? Now that is a long question, or that's a short question <laughs> with a really long answer. The reality is, is it's a whole series of things. I never had any intention of coming to BYU. But the Lord had other plans, and sometimes you have to swallow your will up in his, and then it turns out to be better than you could have ever uh, designed it for yourself. I think the same thing could be said of this project, uh, because when we were all first uh, invited to participate, we all looked at each other and thought, oh my goodness, we don't have time for this. But it's turned out to be a life-changing experience for us. But before we finish, Tyler, would you please just explain a little bit about your own testimony? Obviously, these are things you're passionate about. Christ's life, his mission, the miracles, the parables. These are things that you're passionate about. But why is it that you have been able to stay strong when you are dealing in a world of scholarship and intellectuals where people often lose their way? That's a great question. The reality is, is my testimony is not based on what I know just in my head. That's part of it. But my testimony is based on experience. I have found that when I get too excited about scholarship or too excited about historical facts or figures or language or setting or, or place, uh, and, and items, then I lose my focus and I become a grumpier dad, a less patient husband, a less inspired neighbor and teacher and leader. But when I constantly keep remembering why Jesus did all these things, why it's important to understand the historical setting for why he said the things he did in the setting he did and, and the miracles that he performed – the more clearly I've, I've come to know Jesus in history and in the pages of Scripture and through the words of the prophets, the more clearly I've been able to see his own hand in my own life today to the point where, as I look at this stained glass window, it's not very hard for me to put myself into the position of that lame, leprous, dirty, flawed man kneeling in front of him because it's no longer history. It's now my story. And that's what the scriptures provide for me as a lens through which I can find my own covenant connection with Christ. And that changes how I treat my wife. It changes how I treat my children, how I see myself, how I treat myself in the mirror. And it changes how I look at God. And that makes all the difference. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of Religious Education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, hey guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BOU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.